Hello, Internet. Just take it easy. All right. Uh, it's going to be good. We're going to take a look at uh, Cinema 4D and integrating it with our new After, pl uh, After Effects plugin called Element 3D. So it's going to be good. Wow. You guys look nervous. <laughs> you, you guys look a little nervous. Well, don't worry. This is going to be a disaster. So is everyone kind of a Cinem Cinema 4D user, 3D, something like that? This guy is. Well, we're going to take a look at different ways of integrating your 3D objects into After Effects. And if you've ever done multi-pass compositing, you know you take your shot, you render out the passes, you composite it back in After Effects, and you can do things like relighting and, you know, just have a little bit more control after you're done rendering. Well, I want to show you some different things using Element 3D where you can actually bring in your live 3D scene into After Effects and do all the compositing and the lighting and even change the camera around right in your scene. So anyone uh, here After Effects users? So nobody, nobody. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's take a look. So I've got this uh, simple scene here in uh, Cinema. And uh, we'll go ahead, let's render this. And I just learned this program yesterday. It's really fantastic. I, I like it a lot. Let's see here. One of these is going to do what we need it to do. Oh, one sec. 5.5. All right, so here is a scene inside of After Effects that uses baked textures from a complete Cinema 4D scene. So I've brought it in. And one of the things that you'll notice is that the reflection on this object somewhat matches the scene that we're in. And so what we're going to be doing is looking at ways of bringing in a 3D scene and also creating an environment reflection map that matches what that shot is. So it's going to be an easy process, but you're going to have a lot of control once you bring it into After Effects. So you can do things like have glows and... Uh, you know, different color effects while you composite. So let's look at Element really quick. So this plugin works in After Effects, and you can import all of your objects. And in this case, I've imported a room. So I'll shut the environment off for a sec. And if we come inside, the normals are reversed so that we can actually see the inside. And so we have this room, and it's completely being rendered in After Effects. So it's, it's fast. I have control over uh, some of the materials. I can come over here. Let's see. Change the color, you know, make real-time sort of updates to various aspects of the scene. So the one thing you have to do is you have to get your scene from cinema into element. So let's take a look at how we can do that. That looks amazing. OK, so this is you know, somewhat a typical scene. I'm sure everyone has this scene on their computer, and they use it all the time. Uh, we've just got some objects. We've got a floor. We've got uh, you know, a basic scene set up specifically to create a cool HDRI uh, in environment reflection map. So one of the things we need to do is we need to create that environment reflection map. So what we can do is we can come over here and add a sphere into our scene. And what we want this sphere to do is reflect the entire world. So has anyone seen like behind the scenes visual effects? There's a guy holding like a chrome ball and he's trying to hide behind it. And then there's a guy photographing it and it creates a reflection of that room, and then they use that as uh, the lighting pass for their 3D. Has anyone ever seen that? Has anyone ever seen anything? That doesn't matter, because I'm going to show you right now. So we're basically doing that exact same idea, except we're going to do it in Cinema 4D. So we're going to create a new material. Double click. It's a fast way to do it. You guys can create it or just quick tip there. You're going to like that one. All right, so we uh, double-click on the material, and uh, we're going to turn everything off. We don't want any of these settings. We're just going to go to the reflection, 
turn it on, and it's already set to 100% reflective of this nice little park scene. I wonder who chose that park scene. Like, where is that? Is it just some guy who went outside and... Oh, speaking of which, has anyone seen this app called uh, Photosynth? It's, uh, it's by uh, Windows. Let me just take a break from all this for a second. I want to show you something cool. So I'm going to just shut off the room here for a second. All right, so I was in the lobby waiting uh, to, you know, come in here. I didn't have a pass, but I got one from a guy named Rob. So whoever he is, I hope he's all right, wherever he is. Um, what we can do is we can load an environment map. So what I did is I had my, uh, my iPhone, and there's this app called Photosynth. So does anyone have, like, a DSLR camera? And this guy right here. And this guy. Well, what you can do is you can take a camera, you do like a wide angle lens, and you know, there's even all these like special tripod attachments. And the idea is you can use it and take pictures in the 360 degree you know, world, and then you can use a stitching program to stitch it together and create what's called an equirectangular. So it looks a little bit like this. Let's see, I have a, where am I going here? So it looks like this. It's kind of distorted, but it's basically the point of view of the middle of the scene radiating outward. And so while I was in the lobby, I didn't have anything to do. So I just took this app called Photosynth, and I just, you know, standing out in the middle of the whole place, people are looking at me like this guy is crazy, and, and I am, and I took all the pictures, and, you know, down in your feet, you get out of the way, you shoot the ground, and then you have this, um, this software that stitches it together. It does a pretty good job. You could probably do a little touching up in Photoshop. But I created it, you know, in just a couple of minutes. And so now when I'm back inside of After Effects, I can load up that image. So I can come over here, take the SIGGRAPH. It's, uh, it's 4K. And now I've got a reflection map of that entire room. So it's like we're right there out in the lobby waiting to come in here. You remember how you felt when you were out there and it was so exciting and the tension? No, you don't. Okay. Doesn't matter. Here we go. Let's go back to uh, cinema. So we're going to try to do that same thing except with the sphere. So where was I? I don't know. Doesn't matter. We've added the reflection uh, material onto the sphere. And now we want to bake that into a file, an image file. So Cinema 4D cannot possibly make this any easier. There is a compositing tag somewhere in here called, uh, or excuse me, a tag, a Cinema 4D tag called Bake Texture. So we add that, and we go ahead and we click on it, and we change the width to a 2 to 1 ratio. So we could do, you know, 1,024 by 512. And we go to the options, and we have an option to bake all of these different uh, properties. So we can just click on Reflection. And then we just click the bake. So we could, we could also choose a file name and save it off. Um, I can just come in here, click bake. Now, the scene has a bunch of different uh, effects and stuff set up. So let me go to the render settings. And uh, shut off global illumination. And I'm also going to shut off blurry reflections, just so you guys can see this. And uh, we'll choose bake. All right, so we're baking this. It takes a little bit of time. It's like br brownies or something. You can't force it. Otherwise, they come out a little sticky. You don't like that. You want the good brownies, the fluffy brownies. Yeah, nice. So this should probably be in like a museum, or it looks like a museum. It's just this you know, weirdly distorted image, yet since it's right in the center of the scene, it almost looks uniform. It's beautiful. You just look at it. Look at it, guys, everyone. I didn't make this scene. Someone else did. That's why I can't take credit for it. But I did make it. All right, so we just created that reflection map. So if I jump, if I jump back over here to After Effects, I can go back into my scene. And let's just forget about this room for a second. So we just have our logo. 
And this can be anything. This doesn't have to be a logo. It could be a 3D object, but we'll just use this for now. So we'll go to the environment, and we can load. And we just click on the load, and we can click on that room with the global illumination on. Hit OK. Turn the environment on. And so now we've got that room, but in somewhat of a uh, you know, 3D looking world. So then we could come over here and we could, you know, we could add other objects uh, to our scene and they would reflect this environment map. Now, this is cool, but this environment is just, it's an image. There's no parallaxing. I can't fly around the room, um, you know, which is always fun. But well, can you guys keep it down back there in the next booth? Let's take it easy, right? I'm doing a presentation here. Unbelievable. By the way, everyone who's watching online, just so you know, there's about 1,000 people here, and there's, you know, guys in the, uh, the balcony up there. It's huge. So, whoosh, everyone, quiet. It's so loud. I can't even. It's so exciting. It's so exciting. All right, so we're going to load that image. We loaded it, but... Remember, this isn't 3D. This is just an image environment map. So what if we could somehow bring our entire Cinema 4D scene in, and then because we have a picture of it, it's reflecting that environment. So let's talk about Element, uh, the 3D engine. Has anyone played any video games before, like you know, first-person shooters? This guy's laughing. <laughs> of course we have. It's OK. Well, the, the idea came, the idea for Element came, you know, we're playing Call of Duty. And we're thinking, wow, this is just amazing real-time graphics. You know, uh, the trees, the detail, the textures. And it's like, why can't this technology, you know, be used for visual effects, you know, directly? And, you know, the idea of graphics card, the NVIDIA booth is right next to us. So, look, everyone has an NVIDIA lanyard, except one guy over here has got an AMD one. No, he doesn't. They didn't make them this year. Budget cuts. So... This is, this is getting out of hand. So the idea is you're playing a video game, and you're thinking, how can we take advantage of this technology? Well, graphics card technology is meant to be real time. So you want 60 frames per second. Everything's happening right as you play it. You know, the guy with 30 frames per second, he's, you're, you know, he's getting killed. He's not even that good anyway. He probably has a lousy computer. Well, how could we take that technology but add some more features? So add things like super sampling, ambient occlusion, some of these features, you know, like we could probably show you that. Some of these things that the visual effects people are used to, you know, with your advanced, uh, you know, global illumination renders and things like that. How can we take some of those more impressive features and integrate them? So we got ambient occlusion right here. So check this out. Turn that up a little bit. And, you know, you can create some, some impressive looking renders in After Effects. Well, when you're using After Effects, it doesn't need to be real time. You don't need to be doing 60 frames per second and camping out and waiting for people to come in. You, 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 can, actually, um, you, know, you can actually get away with a little bit of render time because even though this is really fast to us in the CG industry, in a video game, this wouldn't be fast enough because you, know, you need 60 frames per second. Whereas here, you, know, you could get seven, eight frames per second. But to us, it's like you know, why hasn't somebody, you know, created a plugin like this sooner? Well, I'm glad they didn't. All right, so back to it. What are we talking about? This is just insane. <laughs> he knows what I'm talking about. All right. So we want to bring in our whole scene. Now, Element uses UV texturing. So I can bring in this entire Cinema 4D scene. So that's the reason I'm here is Element actually allows you to import your scene into, or excuse me, Cinema 4D scenes are imported into Element. This guy was confusing me. He had like, you know, he had a strobe light on and I was starting to get like freaked out. So, yes. <laughs> All right. So the cool thing is that you can open up the scene directly right now. We don't have to do anything except we have several materials in our scene. So we've got the wood, we've got the stucco. And the way Element works is it, it opens up all your models and it keeps all of your UVs. But if I show you this, you still have to rebuild the textures because it only supports a couple of formats of images. And so it just is easier if everyone rebuilds and we use a separate render engine. But if we go back and uh, load a scene, so let's see here. 
So we're using uh, Cinema 4D Room 4. So here's that scene as it is right now. And so we have all the same materials here. And I can go in and load up all of the texture slots. But you know, there's like five or six. And you know, maybe it takes you a couple of minutes. And then you have real-time capabilities. So that's not a bad workflow. Take a couple of minutes and don't have to really render for the rest of your project if you can get away with it. But what if there was a way to just bake everything into one texture and just bring it in all at once? Well, that's possible. So let's get rid of this sphere. And let's see here. OK, so over here we have all of the objects in our scene. So we have the pillars. We have the background. I'm going to go ahead, take the windows. One thing I want to show you really quick is that this room, you see I have two different materials. I have the room, and I have the window as a separate material. And the reason I have it separate is so that I can change the color over it and in, increase the intensity of the illumination. So in order to achieve that, we just want to separate that object out of the, uh, out of the other objects that we're going to collapse into a single object. So once we have all of our objects, we just need to um, convert it all to meshes. So it's kind of like a, you know, if you use primitives or if you use compound objects, we should convert it into mesh. So you probably want to save your scene, um, resave it. I'd save it, but I'm feeling lucky. We're just going to go through this. It's live. A lot of things can go wrong. A lot of things already went wrong, but we're just going to keep going. <laughs> you probably should save it, though. What, we, what we're going to do is expand all of these objects. So we're going to take them out of the null and make sure that they're all collapsed. So you can hit C and then come over here and choose um, Expand Object Groups. And so now all the objects are individually here. We can take the nulls, just delete them, and hit Delete. And then we're going to take all the objects, right click, and we're going to choose Connect Objects and Delete. So Look over here, we've got all these materials, all these meshes, and we're going to choose Connect and Delete. So now we have a single object. It's all the same, except now it's represented by you know, this one mesh that we can now take and choose Object, Bake Object. So there couldn't be an easier way to do this. You know, I, I use a, another 3D program and baking textures and baking stuff for video games. It can be tricky. You've got to get all of your UVs set up. You've got to, you know, go through a lot of legwork to do it. But in Cinema 4D, it's literally is the simplest thing. So we set a texture resolution that's square. So like 2K in this case. We can include the ambient inclusion, and then we'll choose replace objects. Again, you should probably duplicate that, but you know, who cares? Now, I also want to increase the pixel border to like 5. And that, what that will do is make it so that the UVs don't just get cut off right at the edge, but they'll be expanded a little bit, and it just makes it, it wraps a little bit better. So we'll hit uh, Bake, and you can choose a save uh, file and all that stuff. And then we wait. A lot of baking today. It's like a cooking class. I knew I shouldn't have used that joke. I told myself, don't use that joke. <laughs> All right, so we've baked the object, and uh, it's all a single mesh. Now, it looks like low resolution, like, you know, kind of blurry, but if we double-click on the uh, material, come over here to the editor, we can change the preview texture size to, you know, 2K or something like that, or there you go. And then we have all those pieces together. So now let's go over to After Effects. And let's see. I'm going to import the Cinema 4D scene. So I've already saved these and set them up, but I want to show you from start to finish. So let's go to our My Models. One time I used a Mac, and I liked it. All right. My Models. 3D rooms. So here we have uh, the same Cinema 4D scenes that have been baked. And I'm going to take the room, import it. 
and it comes in and it doesn't have any uh, textures but here's how we can do that we can fix that so we'll take our models documents you can set like a favorite so that you can just go directly to it check that out please yeah right away what is it what does it mean all right uh, maps here we go so I've uh, pre-baked all these uh, these maps out. So here they are. Got the diffuse. They're 4K, and here's how easy it is to rebuild them. We just drop it into the diffuse. It's okay. Or I should put it on the right one. Here's how easy it is. As I mess it up. All right. We'll just edit that out of the live feed. All right, here we go. So now the Windows is uh, procedural, so I can just come in here and uh, turn up the illumination. And we've got all that nice, uh, you know, global illumination that we rendered out. And we can start doing like a million graphics, you know, adding uh, text effects. We could, you know, use the scene and fly around it like, like it's no big deal. So what's going to happen is, the high resolution textures are going to be loaded into the GPU, which is happening right now. And once it does load, it becomes essentially real time again. So, let's see, moving in here. There we go. All right, so let me shut the ambient occlusion off there. So, once you've set this up, you can start bringing in other objects and and you know really do some cool stuff so what about that reflection map that we created earlier well let's take a look at that so right now this is our scene I should probably rebuild it and add all the slots but I'll just load it from the uh, previous file and I just have a little bit of specularity and uh, reflectivity on so you can see these kind of look a little bit chrome like So we'll go into the environment, and we actually have that texture already loaded. So we're reflecting the same thing that our object uh, represents. So then we'll click on environment. One thing we have to do to watch for, reset the view. Excuse me. So you can see that the, the lights on this building are on the right, but the background, they're right in the back. So what we're going to do is just rotate the object, say 90 degrees, and it just depends on how the map was uh, exported and, and where, where everything was position-wise. But we rotate it, and let's add another object into our scene. Um, we'll reset this material. But the cool thing is, you know, there's a lot of familiar things here. So if you're used to Cinema 4D, you know, there's a lot of the same stuff, you know, color, specular, reflectivity. And so you can, you know, get things done without feeling like you're learning this whole new program. It's all the kind of same uh, 3D stuff. The one thing that's slightly different is we have these things called groups. So room four is on group one. And in order to make this logo sort of a separate object, we're going to go ahead and put it on group two. And then when we hit OK, that's going to show up. Uh, let's see here. Top view. Nice. Um, we can go to our top view, fix that. And now we can take that object, that separate object, the uh, biohazard logo, and we can, you know, we can rotate it and move it around as a separate piece. So you know, remember the ambient occlusion from earlier? Well, if we turn it on, we change the illumination influence you can actually start to get a little bit more of kind of a shaded look in your scene and make things actually look like they're integrated more. Um, so this is sort of a look at how you can bring some of that stuff into After Effects. But let me show you some things that you can create that are maybe a little bit more polished. So Element doesn't do ray tracing, so it doesn't reflect other objects. But So we've taken a look at a, a way to somewhat cheat that. And in most cases, or in a lot of cases, that doesn't really make a difference. Because as long as it's reflective, we can't tell, like, oh, that object's not reflecting. Or, you know, it's, it's hard to really focus on that. And if you have a job that needs to get done fast, and you want to make a lot of money, you charge them a lot of money, and then you, you get it done in a day, and you say, oh, it's almost done. It takes two weeks. That's money in the bank. 
Don't do that. <laughs> All right, let me show you um, that scene. Let me show you this demo reel that uh, shows you just different things that were done using the plugin, bringing 3D objects into After Effects and completely rendering in After Effects. So, demo videos. Wait for it. Do we have sound? Okay. All right, bring the lights down. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of different things you can do. You know, there are some limitations, but if you can try to figure out what things are possible and what things that might save you time, then that's the benefit of this plugin. Is anything that you can do with it. We lost one. It's okay. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, I knew I had her with that baking joke, but not so much. Um, you know, I think there's another quick example here. So this is this was in the demo, but I just want to show it again to talk about it. So these are 8K texture maps on the uh, on the planet. And I use a, a GeForce 5800 card. Also some optical flares there. So what's cool about Element is that you're compositing while you're 3D animating. So you can make all the changes, you know, the art direction changes that we're, are going to fix a shot or, oh, that's, that camera's too fast or now that I see it with the glow and the lens flares, I feel there's too much this, too much that. Well, you can actually just live change that stuff and you get even more control than just render passes where you can, you know, you have sort of limited control because those pixels are already rendered. So, you know, when you, when you bring that in here into Element, that's not a problem because you can go back into the textures, you can change the camera move, more motion blur, more, you know, there's actually depth of field that you can get that will, you know, show you what things look like. And this model, this particular model is, I think it's two million polygons. And the way it works is your, your graphics card is going to take a second to bring all those, uh, those points and those vertices. And once it does, then it becomes, you know, What's that, what's that space game? Everyone's in space. The asteroids. Great game. Um, let's take a look at uh, another example of, of using the plugin. So this, again, was in the demo reel, but just kind of showing you some, some, some reasons why integration is so powerful, is that you know, we've got two-dimensional layers. We've got, you know, these mountains are sort of a 3D displacement object. You know, I was actually designing with 3D in my final comp. So I've got my crowd simulation using uh, Particular. And then we've got, you know, just 2D layers of a fake city in the background. But we have sort of real parallaxing because this mountain uh, range here is actually a 3D object. You know, uh, the depth of field is all part of the plugin and uh, the, the blur and stuff. So here's another cool thing. Um, I don't know how much time we have, but I was going to do the whole 24-hour live broadcast and just keep doing the same thing over and over again. 
Let me talk to you guys about environment reflection maps. Um, so this sort of fracture animation is also created inside of Element. So what I did is I took the model, baked all of the textures in a 3D program, and then fractured it. So you know, what's, what's the Cinema 4D fracture tool? This guy. Just kidding. Anybody. Uh, nitro blast or something like that. Like, how do you fracture objects? What is it? Th Thrassy? I, don't, uh, I think I pronounced that wrong. But anyway, you click on your object, you set it up a little bit, and then it turns all of your objects into pieces. And so inside of, wait for it. How come it doesn't switch? I should get the manual for this. All right. Um, so let me show you that project. 15 minutes? Perfect. <laughs> I thought for sure it was going to be five minutes of presentation and like 55 minutes of Q&A. I was ready with your hard and thoughtful questions. All right, here we go. Um, by the way, hi, Mom. She's not watching, but I'll show her this video later. Um, so check this out. So I've taken uh, a shot in Santa Monica of, uh, of a street, of an alley. Okay, that part is like the easiest thing to understand, and I screwed it up. All right, <laughs> we've got this object that's pre-fractured, okay? It's this title. Uh, we can jump inside of Element, take a look at that. And uh, we'll go to like wireframe mode, and we can see that all of the pieces are intact. And let me just throw this on to uh, you know group three real quick. All right, so here's how it works. I've opened it up, and this footage, the scene is already tracked using uh, the camera tracker uh, plugin, and so I have an actual camera solve. And now that I've placed my object in my scene. There's a, a special material type called a matte shadow material, which makes it so that the background is transparent. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. It's just a plane, and that plane is then positioned perfectly on the ground, and it actually can obscure any of the objects that sort of go through it. So you could do some kind of crazy thing where you're running around, and all of a sudden this title comes up right in front of you. That's like super creative right there. Oh, no, we have to go a different way. <laughs> all right. So let me show you about how you can actually take all of those objects. So I've only imported one object, but it's pre-fractured. So we can go into the particle look, and we can do things like rotation and you know, edit the way it looks. But we can also go into the multi-object. And if we turn that on, and by the way, if we look at The end of the promo, you see another example here where we've got objects that are pre-separated uh, and actually model geometry. And that geometry is sort of just exploded out. And it's all just a single object. So that same idea, we can take this, uh, this finished text and we can do things like scatter. We can have uh, random rotation which throws all the pieces everywhere. And then you can animate all these things together, and you can cascade them so that they come together or they explode and turn into something else. Um, there's some displacement. So scatter is sort of randomly everywhere. But there's also displace, which moves them in sort of a pattern. So like the watch is displacing, and then it comes together. So that way, people understand the complexity of the Seiko watch and that all of the working, the, you know, can you imagine that job? Shoot. I gotta start over in the little gears. You have to admire that. Same thing here. Um, and, and remember this is this is all you know, this is all 3D and we can you know we can animate it, move it around. And uh, I think that's it. I think that's it. This is this is going nowhere, it's just gonna get worse. So questions. Any questions? Right here. Sure. So the question is, can you import a camera from Cinema 4D? And absolutely. You can actually take transform data using the uh, 
the interchange plugin and copy and paste right between After Effects. And if you bring in, say, a null object that has that camera data, you can simply come in here to the particle replicator and use expressions to link those parameters together. Sorry. What's new? Hey, buddy. How you doing? How's it going? Good. Um, I don't know if they made you aware, but I'm here to, I'm here to help you with the Q&A. I was waiting for you to come um, Not to I help answer the questions, because I would be of no use. Um, but we're, we're actually streaming this live, as I'm sure you're aware. What? Yeah. Believe it or not. And uh, we're, we're getting questions live as well. Okay. But, okay. but we love our, our live audience. And so we, we love want to you take guys questions too. First, yeah. So Wait. questions here. Yes. Sorry. How how am I involved in the development of our plugins? I, I do nothing. No. Um, uh, so the way it works is I design the plugins, I design the interface, and you know the functionality, and then we have um, our great programmer Sergio. He's watching. Hey, buddy. And he is sort of this genius uh, programmer that makes all of these things possible. And not only that, but he's a really creative guy, too. So it's like, I may not know, you know the best way to implement something, but it's like, this is what I want to achieve. I want to be able to displace it or do this. And he just comes up with great ideas. And, you know, and then it's a matter of, okay, using it. Does this feel comfortable? Does this, is this the way that a user, you know, one of the great compliments that we get is, you know, I opened it up and I got it. I, I was able to okay. do stuff right away. I didn't feel like uh, you know, I had to read the manual and nobody reads the manual. One guy did and now he's dead. <laughs> Next question? Um, or, yeah. I, uh, I'm going to go wait yeah, a little I don't, bit. I don't even so. think you need me. No, I do. I think, I think you're I good. I figured if I started asking questions, you would come out and sure enough, there we are. Element is fully float, 32-bit um, compatible. That was a question. And you can actually load. So remember, I was just loading JPEGs for the environment maps. But if you import a HDR or Radiance into After Effects, you can come at, uh, into Element and click on the custom layers and choose a custom layer as the source material. And as long as you're in 32 bits per channel, you can load that from the custom slot. So you have custom slot 1 through 10 right here. And then, bam, you have 32-bit textures. Good question. Take it easy. It's Is a battle. Which, which one? Uh, are there any, are there any we could do two yeah, questions okay, at the same time. Uh, I, think, I think this guy had it first. Brown shirt. So the question is, is there a way to add uh, shadows with element? And not currently, and then he asks if, if that's a future plan. And I can't say specifically, but yes. Right. No, you know, the thing about shadows, the reason we didn't implement it is that shadows in video games are notoriously not that good. And that's like the fast way to do it. So the reality is we, we want to implement a way that looks really good. And we figured if we spend some time on it, we'll actually have production quality shadows, soft shadows, all that stuff. So all good. Right here. Can I use a what render engine? OK, so the question is, can I use another render engine? Um, not really. You know, we built part of the whole, like the biggest part of developing Element was creating a robust render engine from scratch that uses OpenGL, which is kind of like, think of like a really good metaphor that, I'm just kidding. It's, it's like the biggest part of the whole plugin. We had to create all of the, uh, you know, the mesh, the diffuse, the color, the reflectivity, the ambient occlusion, depth of field. We have three depth of field modes, motion blur. All of that stuff, you know, unfortunately doesn't just present itself. You have to like go and build, you know, there are plugins for After Effects. One I use for uh, lens blur and it's really, really good. And Element has, you know, three different lens blur, you know, essentially plugins built into the plugin. So it was, you know, there's so many different levels to giving people that sort of production quality, and we didn't want to have to rely on so many third-party things, so we just built it all, uh, all in together. Actually, there are a couple questions over here. Sure. Sure. So, do you see better performance out of a workstation GPU versus a gaming GPU? And I think he's probably referring to like a Quadro card versus a GeForce card. And I know the NVIDIA guys are standing right over here. Just 
Just but I will, whisper it. But I will know. tell you, I'll tell you that I use the GeForce cards and they kick out. Uh, they're really good. They're really good. Um, yes. Uh -oh. I picked them. Sorry. Oh, no, no. We can not pick please. them. Please. It's, oh. it's kind of a democracy up here. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. You seem uh, to oh, pick so, that so far good yeah. questions. Go ahead. White shirt. Truly really narrows it down. Do I have plans for another 3D model pack? Yes. Yes. Some really cool stuff. Stay tuned. Let's, uh, well, way back there. In the, the back, back there. Yes, sir. You're, you're welcome. He said Element saved him on a deadline. I'm going to put a little thing on the... No, listen, Element, you know, I think the people who get the most out of Element are 3D artists. You know, you, you can build the things, you can customize it. You know, it's a bridge. It's, it allows you to do what you can do faster, but it's, it's not a replacement. I mean, Cinema 4D, I mean, we all know the kinds of things that you can create with it. But when you have things that don't require sort of, you know, advanced ray tracing or other things, please use it when you can. And when you can't, you know, get busy. Um, I, you know, next question. That's good. He just said, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. I didn't say anything. I can't say what he said. He said something terrible. <laughs> next question. You know what, actually, let's, um, let's take a question from the internet, just, just to mix it up, but don't worry, I see all you guys, One we have sec. tons of time, internet. so don't worry about it. Um, yes, internet? But the, but the, okay, the internet, the internet's first question. Okay. And these are going from C40 Live, where if you guys didn't know, you can watch all of these things streaming live, and you can also watch them later if there's anything you missed, c40live.com. All right, so a question from the internet. How did you get the bloom to be localized to just the windows? How did I get the bloom to be localized to the windows? Good question. So I'll open up the project, but I'll, I'll explain it. So the bloom uh, of the glow is actually specifically based on luminance. So since that's the really bright part of the image, it's going to glow from that specifically. But if I had a scene that had bright specular that I didn't want to glow, check this out. I can come down here. I say duplicate my scene real quick and go to the output and I can change it from composite which is everything to illumination. And so if we look at this let's see here. Mm. Show lighting. Well, I'm not going to try to troubleshoot this, but basically you can output any of the different passes. I must not have the illumination turn up on that. But you can output any of the specific passes like illumination and add glow to that specifically. So if you go to uh, the help page for Element, we've got a tutorial that shows you how to use all the different render passes. So good question. Thanks. All right. I think we've got these two guys. Both of you guys' questions. And you, all of your guys' questions are going to get answered. One so way or just, another. I'm making promises that I just assume you can keep. All right. Green shirt. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So the question is, how do you pre-fracture a 3D object and have secondary chunks that aren't all just large bits? So there's a couple of ways to do that. One way is just to turn up the resolution of the fracturing. So you can make it really, really high resolution. What I like to do to break it up is I like to take all of the objects, fracture it you know, at a certain resolution, just like good sized chunks. And then I take and I unselect them. Then I take some of the, you know, just randomly click on like five or six chunks fracture those ones again. So then there's small bits and there's large bits. And then when you cascade it and animate it together, it looks like there's more detail going on there. So like secondary bits. So good question. All right. We're going to go. Huh, the guy with the NVIDIA thing on. Just kidding. Everyone's right, wearing right, an NVIDIA right thing. Sure, sure. 
So the question is, can you do some more inertial type of movement with the animation engine, meaning you know, break it up into pieces and then come back into something else? And the way to do that, and, and it's maybe not the perfect solution, but there are ways to achieve that. So the animation engine works by taking one object and animating it into the state of another object. So in the case of uh, QuickTime here, the state of this is scattered everywhere, right? And then the second state is it all coming together. So in order to get it to come together and then do something sort of based on that, you can actually animate the position of the second state. So this fringe, even though it's sitting there static, it doesn't have to be. I can actually animate it while the pieces are coming in. So they're coming in, and I can actually animate that. And then if you want to, say, do something else, well, cut the clip in half, and then instead of going from A to B, cut the clip right at the end, and then go back from B to A, and then whatever you change in the A will allow you to go over here and then over here. So you can really create an infinite amount of these kind of loops. Yes. So, and that's why you split the clip, and then you're able to go back again. Yeah, yeah. So. All right, we had a question right here. Hey. Sure. So the question is, can you do video reflections? And uh, yes, you can. Uh, just like I showed where you can load up a custom texture. Well, that custom texture is a layer. And the layer can be a video, anything. So not only can you make an animated environment map, but you can actually create a completely animated video. So in the case of uh, the iPhone um, screen, wherever that is, there's a little bit, of, it's probably hard to see, but there's a little bit of animation on the screen. And that video is simply used as a texture on that surface. So you can, of course, you can do all that kind of stuff and do procedural animations uh, based on it. So yeah. Way in the back. OK, so the question is, how do you handle licensing on a network slash on a render farm? So we don't officially support render farms. Uh, oh, OK. Oh, multiple users. Got it, got it. So he's wondering, how does network licensing work? Well, the simple answer is it just, you just have to do a license for each machine. So when you purchase the plugin, and thank you everyone who has, you can just go in there and you type in your account. And if you've purchased a site license and say you have 25 licenses, you'll have essentially 25 registrations or activations. And you just go on the computer. Once the plugin starts, it says, hey, activate me. You type in your username, your password. It downloads the license, and the machine is ready to go. Now, the only downside is that if you're not on the internet, you have to do the manual activation, which is the you know, you have to upload the, you know, the ID and then download the license. But it, it at least gives you a solution to that. So go ahead, go ahead. Uh, okay, so he's, he's just talking about a specific studio setup on how to, you know, deal with licensing and multiple users. Now, for that, I would just say it's, it's probably a very specific case. I would say just give us an email, and we can try to work out a specific uh, license term that works for your studio so that, you know, you get what you want. Because I think we just want our customers who buy the plugin to be able to use it how they want to use it. And you know, if you have a setup that you know, three guys are coming in on Wednesday and you, and, you, know, you just want to figure it out, we're totally open to making it work for you. And we just figure out a nice, fair system. So thank you. Here we go. Got a question on the other side. OK, so what, what is the idea behind having groups uh, in, inside of Element? And what are some of the issues? Use cases. Oh, okay. Because like issues, that's pretty presumptuous. <laughs> um, tons of issues. No. So the idea behind groups is After Effects doesn't have its own 3D space that we were able to take advantage of with the plugin. And so in order to give you control over a specific object, like a logo or something, 
each group allows you to control that specific object with its own gizmo, with its own replicator. So in this case, we've got this logo, but you can do some fun stuff like do uh, you know, a 3D grid where we have a ton of logos. So all of those replicator options and the core of what you can do with the plugin, we wanted that to be available for every single object group. Now we picked five groups as an arbitrary number because you know you have a logo, you have a background, you have maybe another secondary object. We figured three, four objects and one for good measure. And hey, we could increase it in the future, but obviously with <coughs> excuse me, with OpenGL, we didn't want to make a hundred and people are like, Andrew, uh, getting a crash. Here's my project file. You know, and there's a million objects and textures loaded up, and I would just say, we'll just restart and you know, it should be fine. <laughs> Okay, so does, does Element reflect objects around? No, not specifically because it doesn't do ray tracing. So the speed advantages that you get with Element is because we use environment map reflections. So by using the environment, it looks like it's reflecting, but it doesn't necessarily reflect objects that are next to it. However, there are ways to fake that. So throw out kind of a crazy idea is let's say I create a scene just like we did earlier with a room. We create the environment reflection for that. And then let's say we add inside of that, um, you know, a logo that has like a ring around it. Well, there's nothing that says you can't make another custom environment based on the scene with that object in it. So what you could do is put another Chrome ball in there, create an environment. Uh, I guess a better way to explain it is let's say I have particles in my scene. Create an environment map that's baked that have those particles in the environment map. And so when you load it up, it'll look like these things are actually reflecting on your objects. And inside of Element, you can use the global environment. So that's what everyone uses. It reflects that. Or you can go into the specific material, and there's an environment slot um, that will reflect a completely different one. So let me, let me show you just a basic idea of that. So if I go to my primitives, and let me just use one of the baked-in ones. So we have Studio, right? OK, so right now we're reflecting the world. But I can actually go into the material, change the environment just for this particular one, and change it to Studio Blurred. And so now we have, well, the background's sort of slightly blurred already just to kind of keep the aliasing down. But the idea was like, say you have a watch and you want one part of it to be really chrome looking and shiny, we'll use like a ray traced environment, one that's not blurred. And then say you have like a brushed metal We'll use, change the environment slot to the one that's blurred out, and that will look like it's got uh, like a blurry reflection to it. So you can interchange multiple environment maps. R right, y yeah, you, can, you just load in a custom layer, and you can choose a comp um, that's already pre-rendered, so a video or you know, anything. So you can, you can even, like in the watch example, the background is sort of spinning wildly out of control because time is going so fast. Okay. All right. uh, we actually need to wrap up our Q&A, but Excellent. The, good, the good news is that Andrew is going to be around back at the demo station, so you guys who still have questions, you can still ask your questions. Absolutely. And I'm sorry, the Internet has a lot of questions too, but we're not going to get to those, so I'm sorry, Internet. Send me an email. Or don't send me an email. Just um, yes. How how can people get in touch with you, Andrew, with their questions? Yeah. What I'll do is on the post about SIGGRAPH on the blog. Just go in there, leave a comment, and I'll run through there and I'll answer some questions. Easy. Okay. All right. Let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. All right. And if. You guys want to watch the presentation again, or if there's any other presentations you missed here at SIGGRAPH, c4dlive.com is where we're live streaming all these presentations, and you can watch them archived later. Uh, also at C4D Live, you can register to win lots of fantastic private prizes. One of our sponsors is Video Copilot, so you could, you could win some of the stuff you saw today. Our winner for this hour is Donnie Ferguson, who won Element 3D. Congratulations, Donnie. Very exciting. Yeah, Donnie's a good guy. We like Donnie. So congratulations, Donnie. Again, that's cinema or c4d.com. At maxon.net, you can download 
the release 14 of Cinema 4D, and you can try it out, and it ships out early September. And uh, I think that is about it. And in five minutes, we have Chris Korn, so stick around.